Previously on Drawn of History. Hey Dolly, we just declared war on Britain, so the Americans wouldn't have to face the full might of the British military yet. Did we just become best friends? Yup. The 1812 invasion of Canada turned out to be a wet fart. Don't give up the ship, boys! Tecumseh, they finally get you. American forces were able to take York, which they burned to the ground. Napoleon had abdicated the throne, freeing Britain to attend to other matters. Thousands of troops, vessels, and equipment now free from the Peninsula War were sent from England. Defenses were strengthened along the Canadian border. Which is exactly where they're going to strike. That's where we should have our men. What about here, Secretary Armstrong? Well, I suppose we should leave some defenses in Baltimore. No, I mean here in Washington, D.C. Mr. President, I can't honestly think of one reason why they would attack our capital. Yeah, I think this foreshadow setup is about to pay off. And he was right. By August, British Admiral Cockburn and Major General Ross were traveling up the Chesapeake towards the capital, destroying everything in their wake and freeing thousands of slaves along the way. Where are you going, boy? You can't go joining the Brits, that's un American. Think of all this country has done for you. A hastily assembled militia force at Bladensburg attempted to stop the British ground troops. It was less than effective. And it became clear that the capital was about to be destroyed. Who could have seen this coming? Madison and other government officials had already fled Washington after the Battle of Bladensburg. I think I forgot something. Hey, if you forgot it, it probably wasn't all that important. Yeah, you're right. Paul, grab this painting. We've got to get out of here. Ma'am, the frame is bolted into the wall. So? Ma'am, it's not even the original. I think you could see the watermark. Damn it, Paul. Just grab it. We've got to get out of here. Paul Jennings, go grab that painting. Yeah, I'll take all the credit for it. You could just lug it on your back the whole time. Go grab your own painting. Soon, the whole city was on the run, including government clerk Stephen Pleasanton, who had been tasked with saving important documents and along the way ran into Secretary Armstrong. What do you have there? The Articles of Confederation? The Constitution? Are you stealing the Declaration of Independence? Of course not. Who do I look like? Alarmists. The whole lot of them. Nah, these Brits are just posturing. Washington will never be the real target. This is fine. It wasn't fine. The British Army first burned down the Capitol building and then set fire to the White House. But not before it was looted and General Ross pocketed Madison's love letters to Dolly. Speaking of, Ross, why would you do that? Well, that makes sense. Ironically, the capital might have already been doomed because just then, a freak hurricane hit DC, spawning off a weather phenomenon unfamiliar to most Brits. What in the bloody hell is that? It's a tornado. What's a tornado? Finger of God. Meanwhile, the economy had been in the tank all war long due to the British blockade. And throughout 1814, New England Federalists against the war in the first place kept meeting in the Hartford Convention. This war has been a mistake from the beginning and these embargoes are killing us. <laughs> Mr. Madison's war is a travesty. We should have amendments requiring two thirds majority to declare war, a one term presidential limit and a rule stating that consecutive presidents can't be from the same state. Yeah, and if not, New England should secede and start its own country. We could make Tom Brady dictator for life. Yeah, the secession part of the Hartford Convention tends to be overstated. I mean, come on, what region would really be dumb enough to try to secede? <laughs> anyway, the Americans were not in a position of power as peace talks got underway in Ghent, Belgium. We want an Indian barrier state. No. Yes, we want an Indian barrier state from Ohio to Wisconsin. And we want Maine. Maine is off the table. The Treaty of Paris specifically says it's ours. Now, if this is the level of negotiation we can expect, I'd rather go swim naked in Scheldt River. Honestly, I've been looking forward to it. I've always found letting my little Quincy take a little Rincey is quite restorative. They're just in there working on the Treaty of Ghent. 
They said they'd call me in when they needed me. Ah, I'm here for the Berlin Conference. They said the same thing. But September of 1814 would shake up negotiations. With an additional 18,000 troops now in Canada, the British attempted to invade New York, but were turned back at Lake Champlain. Concurrently, the forces that had just raised Washington, D.C. were about to lay waste to Baltimore. See? I told you. U.S. Major General Sam Smith led militias to hold off invading troops and had Baltimore ships sunk to cut off access to the harbor. What? What the fuck? But if the British could bombard the overlooking Fort McHenry into submission, the city would fall. And as the bombardment began, lawyer Francis Scott Key was aboard the nearby HMS Tonnet, attempting to secure a prisoner release. So is this where we're gonna discuss the release? Honestly, there's no need to lock the door. <laughs> Dr. Beans, I'm here to negotiate your release. Yeah, you're doing one hell of a job. On September 13th, aboard the Tonnet, Key watched the attack on Fort McHenry through the day and long into the night. He peered into the darkness, illuminated only by rocket's red glare, and looked for the flag that flew atop the fort. And come morning, the flag was still there. The British released Key and the prisoners and withdrew from Baltimore. Francis Scott Key, brimming with patriotism, quickly jotted down the verses that would become Defense of Fort McHenry. I gotta tell you, Francis, it's a great name, but it stinks. You should call it the Star Spangled Banner. John, as a militia leader and my wife's brother-in-law, I respect your opinion, but... And why is it a poem? It should be a song. You should put it to music. Uh, I can't write music. Then just steal a song. Pick one that gets the crowd going. Oh, wait, I already did. Tell me what you think. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light was so proudly we held at the twilight to sleep Yeah, let's keep looking. Victories at Lake Champlain and Baltimore evened out the score a little, and both sides were now looking to just be done with the war. So we'll pull back any forces we have left in Canada, but you'll need to get rid of the orders in council and stop impressing men. Orders in council were repealed before the war even started, and with no Napoleon, there's no need for impressment, so whatever. About that Indian buffer state. No dice. That stays ours. And Maine, too. Mm, whatever. Are we done? I have concert tickets. Really? To what? The concert of Europe. Anyway, we're done here. Status quo antebellum. What's that mean? It means as existed before the war. Nothing changes. It's like a tie, which feels weird. A tie in war is like a tie in baseball. It's like kissing your sister. Hey, I could be into that. <sighs> and with that, the War of 1812 had finally drawn to a close. Only it didn't? See, Parliament needed to approve the treaty, which they did on December 30th, but Congress would only get it in February. Until then, it appeared that the war was still on. And remember those British forces that failed at Baltimore? Well, they headed down south to Louisiana and made their way to New Orleans, where one ornery son of a bitch named Andrew Jackson was waiting for them. Ever since being slashed with a sword by a redcoat as a boy, Jackson hated nothing more than the British. Well, maybe the Spanish or the Indians, or the National Bank. Okay, he hated a lot of things, but in 1815, his hate was focused on the British. To prepare, he placed New Orleans under martial law and recruited everyone he could. And when the British arrived on January 8th, 1815, he gave the command. Americans! Assemble. The Americans pummeled the British, which really didn't matter. The treaty was ratified as is when it reached Washington, and now the war was done. No winners, no losers. Unless, of course, you were the Indians. If nobody won the war, the indigenous people of the United States clearly lost, and they would spend the next 100 years watching so much of what they had be ripped away. As for the British, they immediately had a Napoleon problem yet again, so they never really had time to reflect on the War of 1812. They will, they promise. They'll have it reviewed by top men. Top men. The Canadians remember this war, and their successful defense continues to be a source of pride. But they're also proud of Nickelback, so whatever. And considering the lukewarm enthusiasm going into it, it should be no surprise that America eventually forgot what actually happened, and instead focused on individual elements like Jackson, Harrison, and that song that's really just about a flag. 
Eventually, with the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, time would heal all wounds and the nations would find themselves on better terms. Hey, uh, is this seat taken? 13? Whoa, nobody calls me that anymore. I'm the United States of America now. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, you look great. Ah, uh, me? Ah, uh, I stretch from shore to shore, but you? Hey, we've all put on some provinces. Provinces? Is that like metric for states or something? Oh, good old 13. Hey, Canada, I just wanted to say sorry for trying to invade you all those times when we were kids. Thanks. That means a lot. Hey, would you like to dance? As friends. I'd like that. Thirteen? Yes, Canada. Get your hand off my ass. Oh, yeah, that's hot. Damn it, Ross, are you reading those Madison letters again? Shut up, Cockburn. It's been a long war. Why don't you do something more productive, like subscribing to Drone of History? Or checking out another video? Or being a Patreon patron like these heroes over here? Anything's better than that. So, uh, can I borrow them when you're done? No. <laughs>